This is the Power of Genetics podcast, the podcast designed to help visionary practitioners build a more successful practice, transform more lives, and lead their patients into the future of personalized health. In each episode, I'll interview successful practitioners and leading thought leaders who will share their insights and expertise to help you prepare your practice for what lies ahead. I'm your host, Dr. Yael Jaffe, and now... Let's get into today's episode. Mick, welcome to Dr. Miles Barr, who's joining me today on the Power of Genetics podcast. Miles is not only a very dear colleague, but a dear friend as well. So I'm doubly delighted to, to have Miles join me today. So welcome, Miles. Thank you. It's great to be here. So Miles, I have this thing that I hate reading out a bio. It just doesn't feel like anyone gets to understand who you are or the amazing things that you've done. So I'm going to ask you to share, if you don't mind, kind of the story of how you are where you are and and what led you here and what were those defining moments that brought you to this podcast today? Sure. Wow. Okay. So all of my amazing accomplishments and moments. Okay, (laughs) here we go. So I am an internist, right? I'm a, in the US uh, and I'm an internal medicine physician. And that's kind of the, the most basic part of what I do, but it's probably the most important because at my root, I really do enjoy being a physician caring for patients. But I got very frustrated, like many of your listeners might get in the American healthcare system and in other healthcare systems that are very revolved around prescription writing, because it's basically what I was trained to do. So, you know, I actually only reluctantly even went to medical school. I didn't have this inherent drive to always be a doctor, although everyone told me that's what I should be given my nature. And, you know, I'm somebody who just generally kind of cares about people like most of your listeners probably do, but I kind of pushed back against this assumption that I'd be a doctor. So I actually tried going into business and did some internships in the business world and just felt like, yeah, everybody was right. That really wasn't for me. And at the very last minute decided that I would go into medicine mostly because I had a mentor. So that's one key thing is finding somebody that you really respect that can get to know you a little bit. And it was somebody who was very fundamental because he was asking me why I didn't want to be a doctor. And I said, you know, I really, it's not that I have this insane interest in biology. I just really want to problem solve and help people and work with people. He was like, well, what do you think being a doctor (laughs) is? It's not always being in the lab, like in a microscope, it's actually doing just that. And it was really interesting saying, oh, you know, you're right. So I actually can look at it as, as kind of solving puzzles with people, which obviously is what it is. But when you're in college and thinking of all your pre-med classes, that isn't really, really what you realize your life will be about. So he helped me understand what being a doctor was really all about. So I went to medical school with this idea that I would really help people and problem solve what their issues were. And yet in medical school, at least in the US, you really learn how to take care of acute illness. And so it's not so much really being a sleuth, it's really putting out fires. And that's what you learn to do mostly in the hospital. So when I finished medical school training, I actually went to radiation oncology for a little bit for various reasons, but I went back and did my internal medicine training and realized I was really trained to do mostly acute care medicine. I wasn't really trained to do anything that I had set out to do this idea of really working with patients and what's bothering them and figuring it out and and having a bunch of tools in your toolbox. I had one tool was like a prescription pad and that was it. So I said, this isn't okay. I need to like fix this whole system. I'm going to get my master's in public health and fix the healthcare system. So I went to UCLA, did a fellowship where you learn how to do research and it's called the health services research fellowship, which is a great thing to consider for any of your listeners who are interested in learning. How do you do quality research? not bench research, but really looking at things like healthcare systems or structures of care or processes of care. How do you measure outcomes in validated ways, which we all need to be able to do to report the results of what we're doing. And I did that fellowship to prepare myself to kind of work on improving the way medical education was delivered and the way the healthcare system was. Left that, worked with a consulting firm to help work on this healthcare system idea and realized everyone just wanted to save money. Nobody really wanted to improve the system. No one wanted to improve quality. They just wanted to have someone like me who was an MD with a master's in public health that knew about looking at the whole system. And then they could have me propped up there while they took away as much as they could to save as much cost as possible. 
and not really expend energy or even money in improving quality of care. So I figured, you know what, screw this. I'm so done with this whole Western healthcare system that seems too big to try and fix. It was around the same time Hillary Clinton was trying to fix our healthcare system. I had actually come to South Africa during that fellowship and was really struck by, this was immediately post-apartheid, and I was struck by the will, the, the very strong political will to completely transform South Africa's healthcare system because it had a lot of great parts of its primary mm. healthcare system, right? And it actually has, for the wealthy, great advanced healthcare system, and, you know, the first heart transplant, some amazing feats. So trying to kind of make it more equal for the whole population in this post-apartheid honeymoon kind of era without any resources to do so, without really any organizational skills to do so. And here I was coming from the U.S., which had the money, the resources, the organizational skills, but none of that political will. So I was just so frustrated by everybody trying to do things that weren't happening. I said, you know what, if I'm trained to do acute care medicine and look at healthcare systems, where can I do that? And I was led to Medicine Sans Frontier, Doctors Without Borders, which was an amazing place where I could implement these ideas of looking at whole healthcare systems in a whole country or a whole area and, and do acute care where it was needed the most. But while I was doing Doctors Without Borders and I was in various countries in Africa and in Central Asia and a little bit in Guatemala, I saw how much a lot of the people needed our medicines. I was doing a lot of HIV work and with HIV, they needed our HIV medicines. Absolutely, they needed those medicines. But many of the people weren't doing as poorly before we got there as the exact same situations of people were in the US. People with the same CD4 counts or the same disease status were doing much worse in the US than they were in these other countries. And I thought, okay, there's clearly more than the medications. Yes, they need the medications, but there's more to their ability to thrive than just these medications because they're doing so much better than the patients I see in the US. Why is that? And that's what led me to this idea of integrative medicine and looking at what else is there to help besides these prescriptions that I was trying to write. And I saw the power of community I saw the power of, because because we would require Doctors Without Borders for patients to get medicine. They had to come with someone that was their identified care partner. It was an amazing model because we didn't want to waste our medicines. We didn't have enough medicines for everybody. So we had to give it to somebody who had someone that was going to hold them accountable. So it taught me the power of that human connection with someone else that cares about you, of holding yourself accountable, of holding others accountable, of eating more healthy. Because where we were, there wasn't a lot of processed foods in many of these places. They didn't have a ton of food, but what they had was actually coming from the earth and it was much more healthy. They had a lot of folk remedies and a lot of local traditions around healthcare and prevention, they were much more active than any of my patients in the US. I mean, they had to walk a mile for water, yeah, usually exactly. the women. Yeah, so- and The kids walk to school, yeah. Yeah, exactly, or bicycle, you know, with flat tires half the time, but still they're, you know, all getting around. And I thought, okay, there's something going on besides the medication. So I came back to the US, I actually came back for various reasons, partially because of 9-11 and a lot of issues being abroad. And my father was very interesting. My father, who was really torn apart by me being away and these are what he perceived as dangerous countries. Um, he said, aren't there people in LA who need your help just as much as people in all these other parts of the world? And I thought, yeah, it's not as sexy, but yeah, he's kind of right. So I came back to LA and said, I'm going to continue my humanitarian work, but I'm going to do it in the US where I can actually kind of settle down and not hurt my parents by worrying them day in, day out. So I joined a, uh, at that time, the largest free clinic in the country, which is now a federally qualified health center, FQHC, that your listeners might be aware of, and dedicated myself to learning about these other parts of what keep people healthy. I found a great mentor in Mary Hardy, who's amazing. You should have her on the podcast. She's one of the world's experts in botanical medicine. And I said to her, what's the curriculum? You know, I'm an academic. I don't want to just go about and, you know, learn how to sit around with crystals and hum. I want to know what's the science What's the actual evidence around nutrition and its impact on health, exercise, connection, stress management, mindfulness. Herbert Benson was doing his work at Harvard. Like, what is all this all about that helps drive our health and increase risk for disease and decrease risk for early death? And so she helped guide me in what to train on. I did a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona, found a really great mentors there and Victoria Mazies and Andrew Weil. And that's kind of what launched me on my path to integrative medicine. Well, I could just 
carry on listening. And I know there's actually more. I, I mean, I, I do actually know that there's more to the story because in addition to, I mean, I've never really heard you, you tell your story the way you did now. So even though I've known you for so long, I'm, I'm actually really appreciative having the, the context of what you just told yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I ever understood it that way, but I mean, the reality is you didn't just stop there. So your journey in integrative actually started you on a almost another journey, another pathway, yes, yes, which yes. has kind of taken you in, into this incredible space of men's health and sure. how you bring integrative functional to really change the way men's health is viewed and perceived both by men, by practitioners and, and by our clients and our patients as well. So maybe just another minute yeah, or two on, on how you yeah, land in that space. All right. And I'll try and be a little more brief there, but basically, yeah. So I, you know, I was at the free clinic and I said, and I realized how much there is a, a difference in access to these integrative medicine type care between rich and poor. And I really found that our whole mission at the free clinic was to provide access to care, but it had always been access to really primary healthcare, not integrative medicine, not prevention. It was really about putting out fires, which there are a lot of, you know, homeless populations and low-income populations. This was pre what we call Obamacare. So 40 million people in this country didn't have insurance. So we were seeing a lot of people. So I really dedicated myself to building an integrative medicine program there where we could provide free care, looking at diet and exercise and the importance of sleep and stress, as well as providing free acupuncture and chiropractic and a lot of pain management services. And so for several years, built that program up. It became, it's still going on. Now it's been over 20 years. It's, it's one of the biggest programs for free of its kind. And that was amazing. But what I also found about 10 years into it is that we were seeing largely women. And when I would do my fellowship, a lot of the cases were women's health care, which is great and it's important. And obviously it's important because there's a lot of instances in medicine where studies are done mostly on men and women haven't been, you know, accounted for fairly. They've just been assumed to be kind of men and treated, you know, based on studies based, you know, that we use men. So because of that, a lot of kind of men's health in this country has just been considered everything that isn't women's health. But I found mm. that there are specific issues that men have related, whether it's to sexual health or increased cardiovascular disease risk or higher rates of death from nine of the top 10 causes of premature mortality. And they weren't really being specifically addressed in a way that was unique to men. And I found that most of my integrative medicine colleagues were seeing mostly women. And I looked into that and really thought about why is that and realized it's because our messaging was all very you know, feminine oriented to generalize. And there are certainly some men that respond to kind of messages that are more feminine oriented. And there are some women that don't, but when I say feminine oriented, I mean, they were about abstract notions of wellness, for example, that men in general don't respond to, or people who think like a stereotypical men don't respond to, whether that's a male or a female, they respond more to ideas of what's my goal. How can I perform better? Not I'm going to, be told not to eat a hot dog because maybe it'll give me a heart attack in 10 years. You know, they, they don't ne necessarily go make an appointment with a doctor thinking that's what they're going to be told. But they will make an appointment with a doctor when they have a problem and it's very hard to get them in earlier. Mm -hmm. So I realized we really need to create all new messaging to reach men. So I, I thought, and maybe it's a rationalization in my head, I thought I've been working on integrative medicine and improving access to care based on socioeconomic differences. But actually there's a lot of gap in access to integrative medicine based on gender and our messaging. And so about 10 years ago, I started looking at that. I edited a textbook, the first one for integrative men's health, and then really started delving into how do we really change the way we approach this idea of prevention and lifestyle medicine that we call integrative or functional medicine. It's all to me very, you know, it's all the same, really. It's all about really lifestyle and prevention orientation and minimizing risks for disease. And how do we transform some of the language so it's more appreciated by men as something that's valuable to them? So it ends up being a little more performance oriented, I would say. And that's really what I've dedicated my professional work to. I wrote a book called Optimal Men's Health. It's more geared to the lay persons. Unfortunately, it was released like two weeks before COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so it ended up Pretty falling much. into an abyss. Pretty much. February 2020, but, um, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that led me yeah. to start my own practice in integrative men's health and then to join a company about a year and a half ago that was dedicated to building a national network for men's health called Vault Health. And that's where I am now as national medical director. Right. 
So that brings us, there we go. Now, now I feel like we've we've made it to where we are now. And <laughs> so a couple a couple of comments. So the first, I mean, what I find so extraordinary about your story is that I think, so I often think about practitioners that I meet at IFM conferences, PLMI, whatever it may be, and they bring such passion and enthusiasm and hard work. And they often think like that stage of like, how do I? How do I have the impact? Where do I go? Where do I start? And, you know, I'm talking to you and I'm hearing a story. And I know this is a 30 plus journey. This is not something that happened in a year or two years or three years, you know. But I'm thinking what makes it so special for me is your ability to exist in these multifaceted places of healthcare. It's the end of one. So working with one on one patients, building performance, optimal health, anti-aging, whatever you want to call it, the underserved even being in other countries, community, public health, and then also being able to get a message out, whether it's conferences you're speaking at, books that you're writing. So I think it's quite an extraordinary career in that sense, that you've been able to hold that place of caring about the individual, but still be able to have the message. So my question to you is, someone walked up to you at one of these conferences and said, you know, I love your work. I'm so excited. I'm studying integrative or functional medicine. Like, what is the advice that you would give me for the things that I need to do to be able to have that kind of impact, even if it takes 10, 20 or 30 years? Like, what are the key things that you think need to be done to be able to, to drive that kind of path? Huh. Great question. I think, think bold. I think that's number one. I think, you know, in medicine, whether it's physician, nurse practitioner, nutritionist, dietitian, whatever your field of being a clinician is, there are clearly defined paths for most of us. And it's very alluring just to get on that path and it's safe and you stay on that path and you know you're going to have a job, most of us, right? There's a need for healthcare workers in most of the places where we live. So I think my first thing is to say, don't get so enamored with that path and the safety of it that you forget why you went into it because it may or may not be the case that the path you're on is actually going to take you to where you want to go and the things you want to do you're learning amazing skills that should be used toward the purpose that you're really driven to and and it's so easy in healthcare just to assume your purpose aligns with whatever path you're on going to in in the case of a physician going to internship and then residency and then getting a job and that's a and you're kind of led to that and you know at some point you realize it's been 10 years and I'm a gastroenterologist doing what I you know was trained to do but I never really got to make the difference in people's lives I wanted to because I couldn't see a clear path for that what we're trying to do in integrative functional lifestyle medicine is a little bit renegade right and I don't mean to be a conspiracy theorist, but some of the big business interests are kind of allied against us to some degree because we're, we're, we're not interested in really, um, in a box. Yeah. And so I think that's the number one thing is don't be afraid. You have amazing skills that you can use. You're going to be okay. And you're going to be successful enough to to live and support your family, even if you don't stay on that well-defined path. So go work at a free clinic, go start your own clinic, you know, go outside the insurance system, you know, get some other training, just keep thinking, I would say that's the number one, keep thinking a few years ahead. And most importantly, think very specifically, and this is the most important thing to me is what you want to be doing when you wake up in the morning, professionally, what do you want your life to look like? And I would constantly be thinking about that. And if your professional life doesn't look like that, then change it and figure out what steps you need to take to get there. So maybe you're doing exactly what you want to do. Great. But if you're like, what do I want to do when I get up in the morning professionally? All right. I want to like help people work on their, you know, interpreting their, their risks. So what do I need to, you know, for disease and minimize the risk of disease? Okay. So I need to do some research into what really increases risk for disease. And maybe that'll lead you to some passion you have around dealing with stress and helping people manage that. Maybe it'll be around diet and food and nutrition and looking at nutrigenomics like yourself. Maybe it's looking (laughs) at sleep and being like, I'm going to dig deep into sleep, but kind of just thinking about what do you ultimately want to be doing on a daily basis work-wise down the road and let your steps that you take be led by that. So I just to add my two cents worth, I mean, I think that's so true. I mean, people often ask me like, how did it happen? I was like, a lot of courage, a lot of boldness, and especially not knowing everything that I needed to know. 
So the biggest, boldest steps I made were not because I knew the content, knew the knowledge, or felt comfortable. It was actually the kind of comfort in the discomfort. It's what I didn't know. And having the courage to still step in. And I always say, just step in. Because yeah. as you say, you're going to be okay. Yes. Just step into that discomfort. The other thing which I'm a big believer in, which you brought up time and time again, is look for mentors. It's not always one. It's often multiples that come to your life at different times. And they, for me, changed everything. And they come around every decade or every five years and help me change and pivot my direction. And right. as you said, don't be afraid to pivot. Don't be scared to change. And, and people say, like, how did you get so lucky to be in nutrigenomics? And like, it truly wasn't luck. It was, I think, that courage, that openness to what's coming in the next few years, having the courage to step into it and finding mentors. And I look back at all my mentors and I would never be where I am, never, without like four women that I can think of just on the top of my head who changed everything for me. So I think that that's, yeah, completely. Yeah, and I would say a couple things about that. Number one, yeah, don't be afraid to listen to that little voice, right? That little voice that you're like, oh, yeah, whatever. Yes, I know I could be doing A, B, or C, but I'm doing D and it's working great and I'm making enough money. Don't do that. Listen, you only live once, right? And so pay attention to that little voice. It's like, you know, what if I could do this? What if I knew this? That's number one. Number two, about the mentor thing. I, yes, it's really important. I've never had one mentor that was my overall like mm-hmm. guru, you know, like has, you know, led me by the hand. I've had very Not specific, to. first of all, you need to ask. And like for Mary, for example, mm-hmm. like, yeah, I'm not, she wasn't like this overall mentor for everything, but specifically I was like, I need to know what to learn. I need to know what I don't know. So who knows how to guide me in that? Who knows somebody who's kind of academically oriented, who wants to know like really evidence-based integrative or functional medicine and who can tell me what courses to take. And so that wasn't a big ask, right? So don't be afraid to start that search for mentors. Not You're not asking for someone to take you by the hand and constantly guide your career and help you decide every next step for the next 20 years. You're just asking for what is the thing you don't know that you need help with? And then get that. And maybe you'll get something else from somebody else. Exactly. That, that's exactly one. my point. Yeah. I also have never had an overall, but I've had, I've had mentors that come around at the time when I need them to put that piece in the puzzle of one and then. And the other thing is the great Yiddish word of, of chutzpah. You know, you've got to ask. Yes. You've got to ask for help. And I have at times like, taken a deep breath and called someone and said, you know, you're my hero. Like, I love your work. I don't know anything. Can I have an hour of your time to ask you questions? And and it's extraordinary because I've never been turned down ever. No one's ever yeah. said no. Yeah. So I think, you know, that micro, they call them micro mentors. Maybe we could start. Exactly. I love there. that. Micro yes. mentors. We can Perfect. start. There. So Miles, I am very cognizant of our time. So I just, I want to make sure that as this is the power of genetics podcast, yes. it would be remiss of me um, <laughs> not to at least bring us back to where my space is, of course, where I wake up every morning and absolutely love the work that I'm doing is Maybe you could share with your broad experience and all the different work that you do do, what is your perception of the role that genetics is playing and will play in the future of medicine and and the kind of things that you're experiencing? Sure. I mean, we're all, maybe it's an assumption. I feel like it's a given that we are all moving toward personalized care, personalized prevention, personalized performance medicine. I mean, it's a buzzword, but it's actually what they showed in the Jetsons, right? Like 30 (laughs) years ago. I mean, you were just, or Star Trek. We are moving to the point and we really are where you are going to be able to have like a scan. I don't, if you're just listening, you don't see a video of me like moving my hand and like the Star Trek model. And I'm not a Trekkie up and down the body and saying, okay, Al, here's what you need to eat today. Here's a supplement you need to take today, which is different from yesterday. And here's what medication you need to take today. And here's what exercise and you didn't sleep that well, so don't do too much exercise. We are getting in that direction. And that's what we, it's so, you're working in the most exciting time in healthcare right now, because in our lifetimes, literally that's what we're going to be able to do. I'm going to be able to work with programmers to give you a program to wake up every morning and know exactly what you need to do to achieve what your goals are and to prevent disease. But to do that, we need to know where you're starting from, right? We need to know 
where do we build that program from? Like, because if I have certain genes that are going to dictate I metabolize and detoxify differently than you do, then that's going to kind of be the base level of that program that's built for me, very different than you, right? I'm going to start out being like, well, most days, if I have detox issues based on my genes, most days I'm going to need to take sulfurophane, or I'm going to need to take some things that help my liver detoxify, or I'm going to maybe drink a little less alcohol than the person who doesn't have those issues in order to achieve whatever my goals are in life. Whereas, and of course, that's a small part of it. We know that epigenetics is the biggest part, but your epigenetics depend on your genetics, right? So it still informs what you need to focus on. Maybe someone else needs to focus on sleep and stress and they can drink as much as they want because they have an amazing detoxification system because they were naturally born with the genes that are just all perfect in that regard. Maybe other people have genes that increase risk for breast cancer and they really need to look at how they're metabolizing estrogens and really take some DIM or take some supplements on a regular basis. Anyway, I just feel like in order to get to that point where we know what to tell patients to optimize their life and achieve their goals, we need to know where they're starting from. And that's what the genetics is all about. Genetics is foundational. Yeah, it's, right. it's, it's, it's the first layer of what you start building everything else on top of. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. So I think that's a perfect way for us to tie up. And I think unless you have any more messages that you'd like to share, maybe one last thing. I would say be bold. You live once figure out what is going to light you up and what skills you need to be able to do that and get those skills under your belt and go for it. Amen. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Miles Bart. It's been delightful. I could have carried on for like another hour. I as know. Always. Me too. Me too. <laughs> but it's still, we have captured some great wisdom today and maybe we'll have you back again in another time. So Absolutely. thank you so much, Miles. Thank you. I love you. Thank you, Yael. Thank you for listening to the Power of Genetics podcast, brought to you by 3x4 Genetics. For more episodes, please visit 3x4genetics.com slash podcast. And if you are a licensed health practitioner who would like to apply to join our network of over 1,000 like-minded visionary practitioners, please visit 3x4genetics.com slash apply.